Woodruff. And I'm John Griggs. And you're here today with us listening on the Falconry Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about Falconry Meets, Falconry Trials, and another Falconry event called Winterfest. Yeah, Falconry's always kind of been a loner sport um, where, you know, you go out and you hunt your hunt your birds and you come home and you enjoy your time with the, with your birds. But, you know, what happens when you want to be able to share that with other people? I mean, you could be like, have ADD and be like John and Ben here and just be like, let's start a podcast and talk <laughs> about it. Uh, but it's, 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 it's a true thing, John. Like people want to get together. They want to share that passion. They want to talk about it. They want to look at birds and be like, oh, that bird looks like it'll be strong. That bird looks like it's going to have problems. People like that. People mm-hmm. like to see amazing flights together. But falconry is not built to do that. It's not that you can't. But how do you be like, okay, we got 200 people that want to see an epic flight from a falcon diving. How, how do you do that? That's not normal. It, it just is not conducive to the field. Um, and so that's kind of where, over time, a couple of concepts have come out that we want to address today. And the first one is the falconry meat, which is a field meat or a hunting meat. A meat not meaning food, but meat meaning a gathering of people who are getting together to hunt with their birds. And usually this is over a course of several days to a whole week. And uh, these meats, the idea... the, the, uh, the People really have got it down right. There's some amazing falconry meets in Europe. I mean, it's pretty epic when you have, we're going to get golden eagles together and hunt foxes and roe deer even. Uh, but but what are some of the problems you would say that we normally encounter just as a falconer that prevent people from normally having big crowds together? Well, I, for one, it's a distraction. I mean, if you've ever had to do a little bit of a demonstration for a school or something. There's a lot of falconers who will do a little bit of education here and there. And we've been asked to come to my wife's school and things like this. And we even, even did a, a falconry class. And uh, this bird, which she was fully trained at the time, she was out hunting, she was catching things. And so I thought, you know, hey, we'll, we'll show the class because this was like an advanced class where they were going to be interacting with the birds a bit more. We're going to show them this bird how it's supposed to be done, and then try to replicate it with this one, which was much er, much sooner, right? Yeah, earlier <laughs> in the training process. Well, this bird ended up flying down the hallways of the school because she decided not to come to the food that she you know, instantly comes to from distance. So, yeah, people, extra people, uh, situations that the bird isn't used to are big distractions. So... When you got, you know, 10 people out there wanting to see your, uh, you know, your peregrine take a duck or something and, and they're all helping flush, the flushing part, probably great. Mm. But then, you know, bird gets distracted, all these people around. Maybe well, yeah, and like perform. a falcon's looking up, you know, 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet, and it's like, wait, who am I watching? Hopefully they recognize you, but like, who am I watching? Or somebody over here flushes the wrong bird at the wrong time for right. your falcon to dive on. Maybe maybe even before the flight takes place, there's, you know, somebody does the wrong thing and triggers the bird in some way because the, the birds, they react differently to different stimuli and you really can't always tell how they're going to react to another person in the field or maybe 10 more people in the field. And I think most people who have taken somebody out, which most of us have taken somebody out with us at some point in time, mm. uh, sees... Even if they're other falconers, I mean, these are other falconers that have an inbuilt understanding of, well, I shouldn't say that because there's always that that one person that that's like, you know, you look at them, you're like, why are you walking on my left side right next to my bird? I thought that this was kind of a, a, a thing we all understood that, you know, you st- stand away from the bird. But the truth of it is, uh, it's an interesting thing. It goes back to a test question. And that is, you know, where do you stand? And one of the answers was on on the opposite side of the falconer, which usually is right. But the correct answer was wherever the falconer tells you to. Yes. Yes. So sometimes it's our fault. You know, that distraction becomes our fault because we didn't say, hey, my bird kind of gets skittish when people stand behind them. So let's not stand behind them. Stand over here, maybe 20 feet away or whatever. So it just or becomes... Or not wear certain color clothing or don't wear a hat, you know. Or maybe you don't even know that. So, yeah, I think distractions mm. has something to do with it. But... In addition to that is 
uh, we oftentimes travel to our hunting field Mm -hmm. and like take you and I, for example, if we were to draw a straight line, we probably live within 20 miles of each other, Mm -hmm. but driving it's 50 uh huh. You know, or f- and we both have to go. Uh, we have to go around a mountain range opposite directions. Unless it's uh, the summer, I can go right over it in the jeep. That's true. <laughs> you can, yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, you could come up, do it, run over on your uh, Toyota too. In fact, yeah. You know, when you come to visit, go that that route. Um, but yeah, it's like sometimes it's just distance. Maybe sometimes it's mm. just convenience. We all have like very busy lives, and you know, oh, I might get home from work and immediately go out hunting, and it might just not. Don't have the time to, to wait for, for a friend to come over and come fly with you. Though this year, Ben and I have pledged we're going to try to hunt together as much as possible. Mm. And we're going to get footage of it, too. Which get means, some great footage, great training showing. It'll which means, by the way, we're not going to catch anything. Just, just so you know. <laughs> That'll be the curse. It's, it's like forever. <laughs> camera's out, like nothing. You put it down, boom. Ah, come on. <laughs> then you put the camera back out, yeah. film. Here, here's You just missed a great shot because we... <laughs> Right. Which, by the way, I've got to say, um, it's really interesting to compare uh, all of our falconry in the early days. Uh, we tried a little bit to film, and in the earliest, earliest days, like, you would rent a digital rent camera, camera to film. <laughs> like, we are from the era of film. We are not that old. No. And to have a camcorder, you know, your video camera, it's like, oh, we, we got a camcorder. It was a big deal to have something halfway decent. And, like, I remember the first one I ever learned on, you literally had a, a bag with an entire legitimate VCR that it was feeding into. I, I don't know if you remember those. Like, yeah. the kind of VCR that you would have, You just it was one of those with a battery pack. And so you were carrying that. It's crazy. So um, it's I, I lament the fact that we have a fair amount of photos from some of our best adventures, but we didn't have the good equipment. So yeah, we ought to start catching some of that. But I, I actually went and was looking through an old hard drive that I had sitting around back from back then, mm-hmm. and I found a video of ISIS. Mm-hmm. And it's not the just bird, one. Not the... <laughs> ISIS, the bird. Yeah, I I have probably four or five kills on it. Uh-huh. Um, one was the fifth kill of the day, you know, back when out in West Valley. So I actually do have some of that stuff and it looks terrible. Mm. Yeah. But... <laughs> and it's just, you can't believe how, what we thought was so amazing in quality back then. And now it's just, ah, well, it was, a, qual- it's unwatchable. It was a digital, I think it was 30 millimeter digital a high eight. It was an eight. So mm-hmm. it was a digital high eight. So it was digital, but it was still at film in the camera. Uh, uh, yeah, ben yeah, and I, I were, the... we're dating ourselves here. I mean, I, I'm already dated by the the gray beard hair, which Ben isn't afflicted with. He, I get a, looks... I get a couple of white ones every now and then, and I'm like, I don't, I gotta look like Santa Claus. Not me. I, Scandinavian I think, jeans. I need some just for men or something. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not that old. Mm. Well, back to the whole idea of how do you get people together for these things. Uh, so John's mentioned some of these problems that you have where how do you get a group of passionate people to share and enjoy uh, the the art and the hunt of falconry. And so the meat, the idea behind a meat is like, hey, let's, let's get a whole bunch of things together. Let's pick an area that is rich in game. And here in the United States, usually there is an accompanying, like maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, like a, uh, what, what, like a, like so, some sort of a hotel, you typically have a meat hotel and then some sort of a hall, like a banquet hall where um, you will often have a guest speaker. So so anyway, so let me, let me back up. So normally a meet is, hey, we're all going to come. We're going to have an intro to the meet. We all get together and maybe people who know the area are assigned to be guides if helpful. It's like, hey, if you don't know this area at all, don't know what you're doing, I'll, I'll be a guide. Uh, you want to go after ducks, you want to go after rabbits, you want to go after pheasants and uh, go over the schedule. And then there is, and people just go out hunt in the day. And then if you come back for lunch or whatever, there is a uh, weathering yard, which is a big fenced off area where you can put your bird out on a leash and there are people watching over it to make sure all the birds are safe. And we got to do our part. I had one time where at the 2007 NAFA meet, North American Falconers Association meet, I was uh, running the bird yard, the weathering yard, and uh, somebody's golden eagle got loose and fortunately didn't go after any of the other birds, but flew right up on a hill right next to it with its whole leash dangling. Oh, and I was like, well, that was, that was my first meet ever. 
And I go running up there and I'm like sneaking up, sneaking up. And the Eagles like her and some other falconer comes up like smacking his glove. It wasn't the guy who was flying the bird and like spooked the Eagle and the Eagle flew up and I jumped up in the air and grabbed the leash and like Aah! and got it back. But it's, it's like, wow. And I, again, if you're an experienced falconer, you're going to be like, well, you, you should have known and you should have checked all the equipment of every single bird coming into the yard. Yeah, maybe. But I was I was new to the idea of a meet. But that is one of my favorite parts is you can just go and see a ton of birds. You can see in, in rows and rows tied on perches and just see all the you know falcons and hawks and eagles and owls just all sitting there. And that's one of my favorite parts. But then people then usually have a big banquet at the end of the meet. You'll probably have uh, vendors every night where you can go and you'll have people giving talks and giving presentations. And then there's sort of like a vendor's row where you can buy falconry equipment. I usually make and sell lures and obsidian knives and flint knives, things like that. And uh, then at the end, there's a big banquet. And this has changed. We've talked about game numbers. It is a falconry culture to go back and forth. It's like, oh, we want to be proud of how many things our bird has killed. And then we're like, no, no, no. It's more just about the experience. Culturally, it goes back and forth. So some years it'll be like you get a game pin for every prey item your bird caught. And you get here's a pheasant pin or here's a jackrabbit pin. And and if they'll go down the list and announce what everybody got. And I'll give then, you my opinion on that. Yeah. I'm not afraid. Bring back the game pins. I think I'm sorry, fun. but. I think we should be celebrating the success of our birds and the success of us. I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. I don't think that there's anything anti-sporting. And if you think that that's the case, then no, well, you're wrong. I'll fight you on that. <laughs> I, I'm I'm a hundred percent with you. And I think, and, and I think some people are like, oh, well, then we're glorifying the kill. I don't care one way or another about that. If you are catching game, that means you are doing right by your bird you're Therefore, glorifying the success that's different yeah. it's not you're not glorifying the kill the kill as falconers all pretty much i haven't met a falconer that doesn't have an understanding of this mm. and that is you know we need to help to make everything as humane as possible you know that's pretty much a well-known fact in the falconry community we're celebrating the success our mm. bird success and i think it's important our bird success, our success, our dog success, even heck the the falconers that came with us, it's their success too. You know why? Because maybe they were beating the bush that the rabbit came out of, or or the the chucker, or the pheasant, or whatever it is. They uh, experienced it, and they want to celebrate that too. Yeah, and I think it's great. I think that the the idea of well, you know, maybe we should. I mean, what are we going to start having falconry participation awards instead? Mm. I mean, here's your gold star. I, this is something that I believe pretty strongly in is that is that success should be the goal of falconry that, you know, because not only is it good for us, dopamine release, being successful makes you happy. Matt talked about that this last mm -hmm. uh, this last week, but also it's good for them. It's good for the birds. Yeah, they love it. They it, it's it, what they're built to do. And I, so, it's really our job to ensure that they're that they're successful and and those little meat pit that was i mean it was i i love that there was other i went to an arizona meet once the arizona falconers are just some of the best people some of the most warm fun enjoyable people i've ever met and i love going to their meets any chance i get but this one year i think i had i think i brought a harris hawk a goss hawk and a golden eagle and it was funny because the harris and the goss had both gotten just had torn it up and had gotten tons of rabbits and I had this new golden eagle, and he tried, and he tried, and he tried, and all he got was, like, this tiny little pack rat. It's the only thing he actually connected to. So it was great that it was like, okay, you know, uh, uh, Harris Hawk, da-da-da, got these rabbits. Goss Hawk, da-da-da, got these rabbits. Golden eagle, other. And they're like, and tell us, Ben, what was that other? I'm like, <laughs> it was a pack rat. I drove all the way to Arizona with the golden eagle to catch a pack rat. But it was fun, you know, it's still part of it. And it was that other pin was still a little bit of a success because that was uh, his first kill out of state and uh, he was pretty new and it's, it's part of the fun. But one of the problems is, and these things change, these, the way, the, or the way people do these in uh, a lot of European countries, there's a much longer tradition. 
uh, uh, and therefore there's there's things that we don't even do here, like um, to start the hunt, to start the meat. There's these really cool horns, and that they like, and that's part of it. We need some horns, I guess, guys. Come on. Yeah. Um, we need we need we need it. We need uh, falconry horns in America to start the hunt. To signal right. the start of the hunt. But it's kind of cool. And the other thing too, there's a um, maybe I won't mention his name because I didn't ask. I, we we try to do that. We try to if we're going to mention somebody before we'd like to kind of. But uh, he had uh, been hunting in Europe a lot and and pointed out how in America we dress really sloppy when we go out hawking. It's like oh we're going out to the desert. We're going out to the farms and put on your grubby clothes and let's just go like go hunt. Is often often kind of thing, and he's like, no, no, no. In in many other countries, it's very dignified. You put on your your best hunting clothing, which even involves a tie. You know, you're dressing respectfully to the bird. Now that to most Americans seems so different, such a different concept. But he got me so hooked that I I, I tried it for like for like one season. I was all dressed up and and not not like Sunday best kind of dressed up but it's like yeah I dressed nicer and got a nice wool hunting jacket european style and thought it's just a different approach um and you see that in those meets where people will wear a hat and it might have some game pins or a meat pin from a previous meet where we, uh, you might see a falconer with a patch from a previous meet but you usually don't see that kind of this is my hawking hat with these pins um but i think it's cool i think it's cool that there's different versions of the meat idea but the big problem, John, is that even at its best, a meat does not cater to the part of the idea of a lot of people seeing that epic flight. Maybe you and your buddy and your dogs at the meet, that's not much different than home. You went out, okay, we're all together having dinner, or we're all together having a, you know, whatever, the vendor's row. And then the next morning, us three go out and go fly. That's not much different than home. So back in the day, there was a falconer who thought a lot about this. He was a Utah guy. His name was Gerald Richards, and he was very much a living legend in the falconry community and was well-known all over the world. And uh, Gerald was a good old-timer. Um, he was an amazing man, an amazing falconer, an accomplished athlete, a musician, and a singer, and quite the falconer. And he you got to understand uh, falconry in America the concept of flying a bird properly from a from a falcon properly from a high pitch, you know, very high, you know, thousand feet, two thousand feet, three thousand feet up, and diving down and consistently catching game. He was one of those early guys who was like, Yeah, of course this is doable. The ancients did it, we can do it, and pushed for that level of excellence. And there is nothing like that on earth, like seeing a falcon dive from that speed and catch something. But again, like we mentioned earlier, that's a difficult thing to do with a group to be like, oh, let's get, you know, 50 spectators, 100 spectators out and we're just going to uh, go hunting together. It's like, ah, oh, there's so many things that can go wrong. It's not easy to orchestrate. So he had the idea for a concept. He said, what if we go at the end of the season when, in theory, any Falcons being flown properly are going to be fit, they're going to be in shape, they're going to be uh, ready to, to tackle everything. And at the top of their game, let's go out to the desert or the prairie and uh, we'll, and just kind of line up sort of um, tailgate party style. And then we'll walk out into the field. Everybody else will watch from the line of cars and we'll have the participant go out and set their bird up to go circling up, waiting on. And at the right time, we will serve high performance uh, racing Homer pigeons that are that are genetically perfect for evading falcons uh, and let them attempt to catch this species. And, and what it made possible was vast numbers of people to be able to see over and over again the most epic falcon flights perhaps in uh, human history as far as what because we had radio telemetry now. We had, you know, four-wheel drive vehicles to get out in good country. Uh, we've reached the pinnacle of, you know, a racing pigeon selective breeding. And so to try to do all of that was pretty incredible. And uh, some people gave him a lot of flack about it. Some people were like, well, that's not real falconry. Uh, you, you know, you're, you should be out just hunting wild game as it is. And he's like, just come and enjoy it. You know, if you call it that, you're, you're having a, a falcon go up thousands of feet, dive hundreds of miles an hour and catch one of the most sporting uh, uh, prey species capable of evading a falcon. 
<coughs> and those flights were incredible. A little bit more Falconers being their own worst enemy there. But mm-hmm. but yeah, they I've been to a few sky trials and they're they're amazing. They're really cool to watch. I mean, it's different every year in terms of how good it is. But yeah, those pigeons, as I understand it, are are, are flown on foul. We're or at least in some of the years. I don't know if it's every single year. I shouldn't say that. Um, but are flown under falcons regularly, so they know how to behave. Mm-hmm. They're they're certainly the ones that have the genetic predisposition and uh, capabilities to avoid the falcons. So. Mm-hmm. So that idea, that whole concept, it it gave falconer, it got, it, uh, prospective falconers and their families a chance to see just how epic and breathtaking a falcon flight could be, and um and 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 so the it, it became called a trial, and they called it the Sky Trials. I think originally they called it the Gerald Richard Gerald Richards Pigeon Derby, but it was it was a new concept. And it took off, and it and it kept falconers pushing for excellence. It's like, okay, you get your kestrel, you get your red tail, maybe you move, and then like eventually, I want to really try to accomplish something great with my bird like that. Um, it's gone up and down over the years, um, and we'll get to that in a second. I do want to say, uh, take a look at this image. This is there was a DVD produced that was about Gerald Richards' life. And also how he came up with the evolution of the Sky Trials concept. We're going to put a link. I actually really enjoy this. I remember when it first came out. I know the people who produced it. And I'll put a link in the description. So if you want to buy a copy of this, I highly recommend it. Just because good information, fun. It gives you a better idea of the history of falconry in America and the Sky Trials concept. But the Sky Trials concept itself spread all over the world. And uh, even though it had so many naysayers, it in some countries like in Spain, it has completely revitalized and, uh, falconry and made falconry explode where it was all but dead in Spain. And so many other countries, many other states other than Utah have picked up this idea and do it. And a lot of people just do it casual like it was in the original days when Gerald started it, where it's like, hey, uh, on this date, uh, meet at this sign and we'll, we're all going to drive out and I'll pick the best field and we'll go. We'll, we'll do it. Um, the sad thing is in Utah itself, it's it's had its ups and downs. And right now there's kind of been uh, some back and forth discussion on where it should go. Um, should we lower the standards to be more inclusive or one falconer? Again, I won't mention his name because we didn't ask permission ahead of time said, hey, no, we need to be make the the the, the stakes way higher to make it a pursuit of excellence. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But well, that. Yeah. I, and. And. Just you know, to be clear, I, I, we both, Ben and I both believe that this, that getting together and doing these things is important. And I think that it, uh, one falconer who uh, I think they posted this on Facebook uh, mentioned that that we really need to remember the people, not just mm-hmm. the birds, but the people. And I think that in doing so, and keeping with the spirit of that comment, um, having meets and trials and things is important. And and it's kind of odd that in this today, at the today's day and age of interconnectedness, we'll call it that we don't have more of these. It's easier to organize. It's easier to disseminate. It's easier to, to get people notified to know where to go and where, what to bring and, and how to prepare and all, whatever there is. It's amazing that we have fewer meets and trials and not more meets and trials Mm -hmm. and i just like you know just like i said about earlier about ben and i making equipment this year it was right right before the call actually that we are going to get out and we are going to hunt together we are going to go out and and we're hoping to fly long wings we're gonna fly together on ducks and pheasants and maybe chucker whatever we -hmm. are going to fly together and if for some reason we have another, you know, 10 times worse year of avian influenza, we're just going to fly them on pigeons if we have to. But we're going to fly and we're going to fly together. Why? Because it's important. The camaraderie mm-hmm. and the the uh, fellowship and fellowship is not not uh, sex discriminatory, discriminatory, by the way, of falconers is important. And I think that we are a little bit losing it in Utah. Just think about think about it mm. just for a moment. When I got into falconry originally, mm. not when I got licensed because, well, we didn't really have the money to do it. When I got interested back in the 1900s, 
we we, we had the King Fredericks meet. We mm-hmm. had the Sky Trials, and we had Napa. Bi- those were all three really big deals, right? They were mm-hmm. they were they were big meets. Right now, we still have Napa. We still have the Sky Trials, even though it was one day this year. There just wasn't mm-hmm. enough entrance to have you know a preliminary and a finals, which there's a lot of things that could be involved with that. For example, the 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 fact that game numbers were really bad this year for long wings and mm-hmm. uh some guys just weren't flying uh, but also you know a reduction in territory for flying long wings so a lot of people are flying micros or short wings or whatever anyway um but now really that's that's all we had and when you talk about just the local local stuff we had the is barbecue oh that's we also had the is barbecue before that too we have the IS barbecue and Sky Trials, and that's it. In between there, we've had you know things like the King Fredericks, Winterfest, and things like that. Yeah, I used to when I was the the guy over events for our Falconry Club. I used to have four events that were club events, uh, hunting events. In addition to the Sky Trials was going on, the Napa meet was going on, Rabbit our event Roundup, Winterfest you know? Rabbit Roundup was one of them. But we had these four other events, and in addition to the regular IS barbecue, we had the burnout barbecue that I put on. You know, we used to, it's like, for a lot of people, especially a lot of people who have been in falconry for a long time, I admit that, no, 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 falconry is their escapism. They want to be away from people. They want to be out. It's their wilderness experience. That's fine. But falconry needs the support and, and camaraderie of fellow humans to share their passion, to share their learning and teaching. It doesn't matter that you've got falconry podcasts and youtube videos and books available there's so much you can gain by hanging out with other falconers get different other perspectives and other other viewpoints and and just getting out in the field together and so i think these kind of ideas are so important yeah i think that uh i would really love to see all of those things come back you know the uh, king frederick's meet they uh keep the is barbecue obviously do the do the a burnout thing at the end i think it's a great idea Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, you know, it was great back then, you know, bringing back as many events as possible. Why? Because it gets us together and it, it creates, it creates a, a membership throughout our, our group. Because, you know, when, when you, when you do something together, it bonds you in a way that you don't have just by watching a video of somebody do it. Hey, maybe, you know, that person, that's great and everything, but I honestly, if if there's, I know that it's it's February and not January, but if there is a, a resolution that you can make for 2023, it's get out and do falconry with your falcon or commute falconry communities. Go and because if you don't, there won't be a falconry community. I'm sorry, but the online space cannot maintain this. Mm, that's not what it's built for it's and that's and and the the friendships you make in person especially at meets themselves are incredible you meet people from other i have friends that i met in 2007 at my first nafa meet from the other from uh, other countries that i'm still friends with um and and i love that i can just be like hey oh i have a question about a raptor in your country i have a question about the history of falconry or whatever and got it and people are like that where you could they 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 you're just make these lifelong friendships that because falconry is a worldwide thing it's happened all over the world just about every country in the world and we all get it I, we've talked about this before you can look at ancient paintings of falconers and the things they're doing it's like i'm doing that same thing uh i'm crawling on my belly cautiously towards that goshawk too and i think that because of that it's unifying of the human race. If humans come together, talk falconry, practice falconry, experience falconry together, it just, y'all go home so amped up and excited and making friendships that actually matter and friendships that pay off. I I won't go into too much detail, but um, friends that I made at a meet, years later, I was asked to be a guest speaker in a Canadian province that does not allow the wild take of raptors. And because I wrote the book on trapping wild raptors, they're like, here, come and be the guest speaker at our meet. And we are going to intentionally invite uh, our like government officers who are overseeing this and who are doing the pushback to us trying to get a wild take. We'd like you to do that and kind of say, hey, look, here's how it, you know, give that perspective. And so 
just the friendships I made ended up able to help people in another country uh, with 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 laws. So you never know what friend you're going to make could later on involve laws in your country or in their country. It's it's, it's exciting. Yeah. But that kind of comes to kind of the last um, sort of organization event that I want to talk about, which is kind of a weird one. It's one that I started and I haven't done it for a few years now, uh, especially ever since 2020. And it's an and but I want I hear people talking about it, people who miss it and love it, people who like to mock it, um, which Gerald Richards was always mocked for the sky trials, too. And a lot of people know of it, but have no idea why or how it came about. And so I just kind of wanted to set that record straight and compare it, honestly, to a really epic form being done in the Middle East today. And Winterfest, what it was years ago, we had a Utah Falconer who was also a lawyer. And this individual, the government had done something technically illegal. They had broken a policy of their own. And he's like, I'm not putting up with that. So he sued them and he won. And as an act of retaliation to all Falconers, uh, to, you know, to get back at us, they said, OK, we are not going to let any Falconers in Utah hold a meet or a trial without getting a meet permit. And you have to do it this many months ahead of time, like nine months ahead of time, even though your event is only happening in a month and a half. Um, and remember, a meet is, you know, where you come together and you go out hunting wild game. A trial, like a sky trial, is when you're coming together and you're serving bagged game, like racing pigeons, under a falcon or a bird. Um, and so I was really mad about this because I liked that meets and trials gave me, among other things, a chance to see a lot of birds, everybody else's birds. I want to see that. I want to, I want to take pictures and go home and paint these birds. And, and that was gone. And to me in, in the United States, one of our rights that we supposedly have in our bill of rights is the right to assemble. The people can get together. You want to get together for religious reasons. You want to get together and talk about Falcons. You should be able to, but they're like, well, it's dealing with, uh, you know, the potential hunting of animals. So we have a say over it. And I'm like, okay, well, what if I craft an event that is specifically crafted around those temporary illegal policies that the state put in place to where um, they would have no say. And I'm like, well, the hunting of any prey, bagged or wild, it was the big sticker. So I made an event called Winterfest, and it was um, it was several things. We did races that were just men all in good fun for, for mostly apprentices. It was like we would let people race red-tailed hawks and kestrels, and we also added Harris hawks because at that time an apprentice could only have a red tail or a kestrel, and we had been told that coming up they might also allow Harris's. So we allowed Harris's. Uh, we would do some exhibition flights. We, then we would have a big bird yard, just like at a meet, a weathering area where you could see all these birds. But this is a one-day event. It, did, it wasn't overnight. Um, and just for fun, for the heck of it, we did a kind of a dumb beauty contest with four oh, kind of goofy categories. So you'd put a number by your bird, and you could vote on that. And then inside, I would talk to all the falconry uh, supply companies and say, hey, will you donate some good supplies? And we'd have a huge raffle of falconry equipment and books and art. And you could go and get, uh, you know, you're a new apprentice or a prospective apprentice. There's a good chance that you might get some good falconry equipment. And then we had a huge potluck and gave awards for the for the flights. It was fun. It was um, it was really trying to cater to be as friendly as possible to anybody. It's like, hey, you interested in falconry and your spouse or your kids? They're not too sure. Come to this. This is a good way to get your feet wet and uh, kind of have an introduction to it. And the first year afterwards, we're like, all right, and now it's over. So this is no longer an official event. We're going to go have a trial over here. <laughs> and we actually did like a mini sky trials afterwards um which was officially you know like off the clock so you can't count it as part of the uh, part of the get together um it was fun again we haven't done it for a while uh it's a ton of work because it was always free unlike meets and trials it was 100 percent free but um that was the the impetus for doing it and the closest thing i've seen to that is um in the Middle East, they are starting to do these epic events where they'll train like jeer falcons and saker falcons, and they will fly them against these um, 
different types of drones that are, you know, like a fake bird. bird that you have. Yeah. Yep. But, and the, but it's all very highbrow. It's, it's, it's epic. And there's a lot of money and a lot of prestige involved, but there's no actual hunting, which I know some people are like, well, that's, that's not falconry. It's not the point. The point is, how do you get and show horizontal athleticism of a falcon in direct pursuit for a large group? That's hard to do. And how do you do in a competitive way that pushes the pursuit of excellence? Like, well, I want to do as good as that person did next year. Okay, I'm going to work harder for it. You put a little bit of a competition in there, and it does that. So that's certainly not Winterfest, but it's kind of the same idea. Um, and I, I don't know if we'll ever do Winterfest again. Um, if you, yeah, Ben and I have been talking about about Winterfest lately, and um, so you know we're we're thinking of ideas on on how to if we would want to revitalize it. I mean, even if put it this way, even if Winterfest were just a mid year IS barbecue, mm -hmm. I still think it should be held. Because the, the, the chance to I that's the other, the other thing we didn't mention the trials like a sky trial most people don't have their birds out they might have them out in between flights but there's not a weathering area yeah. so you're seeing amazing flights but you're not getting to see all these birds and that's something I love I want to see birds yeah. and I want to be talking to my friends and making new friends being like oh my gosh look at that that's the darkest peregrine I've ever seen wow that's the smallest merlin I've ever seen wow and just shooting the breeze just bsing about birds with people I love doing that and um so we're going to be looking for ideas on how to do it we've talked about just putting together new meets as well and just saying hey John and Ben sponsored meet we're having Come to this area yeah. and come fly. We're gonna do a weekend hunting meet, uh, like we used to do. Yeah. You know, that's that's what we did. I I got frustrated when see the, if the, the association wants to get involved. I mean, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Yeah, we just want to do things that are more conducive to getting people together to see birds in a weathering area, to see epic flights, and to also get out there and hunt. And the and, only benefit that Ben and I are gonna get from this is getting to see other people's birds. Believe yeah. me, we'll probably spend money on it. So <laughs> making new friends and uh just and seeing birds and getting people together. Yeah. That's well, like oh well, here's an idea for Winterfest right here. I'll put it out here right as we sit here. I uh, I'm building one of those uh bird analogs mm. for training our our long wings this year. Um it's gonna be a like super cheap um It'll be designed to be broken, kind of a thing where just the core of it will be, will be you know the motor and the and the electronics and everything like that. But the part that you that the bird touches will all be designed to be broken, and mm. and it can be rebuilt for three dollars, and you do it yourself, you know that kind of thing. So anyway, all all we can discuss that in another time. But just an idea, have a meat that is like. IS barbecue in the winter kind of a thing, maybe early January, because I know that they're they're holding a sky trials in late January this next time. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, do something like right after New Year's where everybody's kind of you know just starting their New Year's resolutions or whatever, and then say, Hey, we have a bunch of these bird analogs that we're bringing just to show people what we've done, what we've been messing with, what we've been having our birds destroy. <laughs> Yeah, exhibition flights can be really fun too. They don't even have to have the competition. But even they can. Do you want to? Do you want to? You know, at the end of the day, we're all going to go out and mess with these. Do you want to bring your bird out and put it over one of these things? Do you mm -hmm. want to try it out? Does anybody want to go and watch us do? Watch them do this. You know, even even if it's not a judged situation, it's like I know some people that if they were given that opportunity, they'd be like, oh heck yes, I try that. I tried mm -hmm. it. Oh, well, do you want to try this RC uh, RC Redtail Lure? You want to try mm -hmm. that out? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I've got it because I'm building one of those this year, too, because I like to build things. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's that's the kind of... I think that that could be something that people would be could interested be in. Really cool trying additions to add out. to an event. Yeah. Just trying new technologies and new ideas to get a bird fit. And, you know, you're going out flying uh, and hunting earlier in the day, and then you come back and like, hey... We're going to be doing this over here. Anybody wants to try it out, come give it a whirl. Yeah. It'd be really cool. So there's things like that that, that could be certainly done. And um, I, I would really love to see something like that happening to where it's another excuse for us to get together, to everybody gets to see each other's birds, see how they're doing. And 
I, I would really love to see hunting going on surrounding it. It doesn't have to be like, these are sanctioned hunts and these are the fields you go to. Not like that. Not like a NAFA thing or something like More that. More casual. More casual. A casual, hey, let's go out and hey, you got that red tail that's been doing real well. Let's let's go out and see if we can catch a bunny with it or whatever. Yeah. I, this That sounds exciting to me and great. I agree. Something I, agree. I would support. So there's some basics for you on the concept of meets, trials, and the Winterfest concept. Uh, let us know your thoughts and your ideas. We'd love to hear them, um, what you hate about all of those, what you think is wonderful, and what you think could be new ideas for Falconers to try. And, uh, John, can you give us a shout-out uh, about your channels? Yeah, I run a channel called Falcon's Ledge. I review flight sim hardware and... Uh, well, flight and space sim, just pretty much anything that flies. I also um, do a lot of maker stuff, like... Uh, building joysticks and i'll be doing on that channel some of the you know building that that bird analog remote control thing and uh might be doing some type of drone stuff on there for for falcon related stuff occasionally i do falconry videos but it's it's mostly this flight sim hardware stuff so if you like aviation if you like flight sims if that's something that that is your summer hobby which it is mine um come and check it out quick Quick, quick, quick problem here, mammals. Uh, when we recorded our podcast, we forgot to do the skulls. Last week's skull, this one, it's a moa. A giant bird, flightless bird, now extinct in New Zealand, over 10 feet tall. And yes, if you are from New Zealand, I understand it's pronounced mo, but you have an accent, so moa. We hear an uh at the end, so moa, mo. That was last week's skull. This week's skull to guess for next week. You ready? Uh, it is a Jurassic species. Uh, there we go. Look at the teeth. Look at the top of the head there. This species is, uh, I'll give you one clue. Not only is it Jurassic, it had four fingers on each hand. So that is the skull you need to guess for next week. And now back to the podcast. All right. Give him a shout out. Go check out his channels. Uh, we thank you all for watching and listening. We'll catch you next week. And as always, happy hawking. <laughs>